Good afternoon. Welcome to American Society of Human Genetics. Welcome to Boston. I'm here to tell you that Major League Baseball should keep its eyes open. This society has selected the City of the World Series far more frequently than one would have expected by chance. P-value something like 0 0.0001. Given that we select our city four to five years in advance, it's all the more remarkable. So Boston should be extremely grateful to us. The World Series begins here tomorrow. It's my great pleasure as the immediate past president of the society to introduce this year's president of the American Society of Human Genetics, Jeff Murray. Jeff received his bachelor's degree at MIT, his medical degree from Tufts, his pediatric residency in Boston, and his medical genetics fellowship at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's been at the University of Iowa his entire career, and his career spans, in my view, the breadth of human genetics. He was one of the people involved in early linkage mapping of the, what we now call the genome. If I remember correctly, he and his group uh, staked out chromosome four, although he may correct me if I'm wrong. He was involved in the integration of linkage maps with physical maps. And then when the genome became available and this fabulous world opened to us, he began the pursuit of two phenotypes with which he has intimate knowledge in his role as a pediatrician, namely oral facial clefts and prematurity. For both of these complex disorders of mothers and their infants, he has integrated his knowledge of pediatrics, his awareness of genetics and genomics, and his awareness of environmental risk factors. It's been a remarkable synergy of an understanding of all of the components that go to make up the causes of complex traits of enormous importance to all populations. In consequence of this, among many other honors, the Gates Foundation has asked Jeff to be their consultant in organizing programs sponsored by the Gates Foundation to try to resolve the question of prematurity, uh, uh, premature birth among women in middle and lower income countries. So Jeff's career has spanned hardcore genomic technology development, working as a pediatrician, and understanding of the environment, cultural, lifestyle factors that go to contribute to these complex traits. He's been an exemplary president of our society. I look forward to what he has to say today. Jeff. Uh, Showtime. <laughs> so, as, uh, so first of all, thank uh, Mary Claire very much for the wonderful introduction. And as you heard from uh, my pedigree that she described, um, although not the years, I moved here in 1967 when the Red Sox uh, clinched the pennant um, for the first time and then went on to play these same St. Louis Cardinals. Um, and as a result of that, uh, failed to win the World Series that year, as they did in a few subsequent years while I was here. But eventually, um, in 2004, they did win. And so I'm pretty excited about uh, the fact that I'll now have the opportunity to uh, be in Boston once again when they're in the process of playing St. Louis. And hopefully, we'll get to see them be uh, victorious once again uh, this year. I also wanted to acknowledge on this first slide that it's uh, 50 years ago um, this year that Massachusetts became the first state to mandate PKU screening for newborns on a statewide basis. This is one of the first and earliest enormous public health successes that genetics has brought to us. And as we know from the theme of this meeting, and as you all hear in talks going forward, this is a tremendous ability, it's a tremendous capacity for us to apply the genetic knowledge that we're developing today to directly benefit uh, individuals. And as I'll come back to again a little bit later in an era of genome sequencing, we're also discussing not only the scientific and medical applications of things like sequencing to newborn screening, but also dealing with all of the societal issues that arise from that as well. So as I'm giving this talk today, um, I am going to focus on something that most of you will dread tremendously, which is this idea of a strategic plan. Um, but I'm first going to try to go through um, a little bit of history of our society, some of the things that have helped to form me. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this plan that we have underway only as an act of trying to stimulate you over the course of the rest of this meeting to think about the American society, both the 2,000 or so of you that have never been to this meeting before, 
as well as the many numbers of you who have been to this meeting for 30 or 40 years. Um, we're at a critical time in genetics and finding our place in the world, and we're hoping that meetings like this can help to stimulate us to think about where we're going to be a few years from now. I also wanted to put this first slide in as a way of recognizing up front the staff, particularly Pauline Menhennet and Joe McInerney, who have put this meeting together, who had to deal with changes in our vice presidential status within the society, who had to deal with the budget crisis that took place over the last couple of months, which necessitated lots of changes in the meeting, and then all of the issues that just surround a meeting in general. And then finally, also to thank all of you on, as members, as committee members, as board members who really make the society what it is. And the somewhat goofy title that I chose for this uh, was a part in acknowledgement of the fact that uh, these speeches go on year after year after year. Um, probably most of you won't remember them as you go forward in the future, but what I do hope is that you will remember the sort of mission that you have as being a member of the society to try to improve it, to improve your own work, and to improve uh, the lives of others as we go forward. So I mentioned the strategic plan. I wanted to very briefly show this curve, which is the meeting attendance in the society over the last 60 years. This comes from a really nice article that was written by Terry Hassold and Bryony Keats a couple of years ago in the uh, journal, and it shows that we had this enormous burst of growth, burst of growth that began in the 1970s um, when we had only a few hundred uh, attendees at the annual meeting, up to the six or 7,000 individuals who attend these meetings today. So the good news is that we grew very rapidly and became a huge society that offers many, many benefits to our membership. The concern is also somewhat illustrated in a slide like this where you can see that there's been a leveling off in meeting attendance over the last decade or so. And whether this is a genuine cause concern or whether we've saturated the genetic market is one of the things that we need to consider as we kind of go forward. Well. As I was putting this talk together, I uh, also realized that my own personal history uh, in some ways reflected the history of the society and that we were bo both born in almost the same year. I was born in 49, the society in 1948. Um, and my personal history uh, shows up on the little graph line that I show here in part because in the 1950s when the structure of DNA was elucidated and when we first identified the normal chromosome count of 46, I also had a brother born who had trisomy 21, although his diagnosis didn't, uh, wasn't made until he died um, in his late 20s in the 1970s. Um, he uh, suffered under the regimes of the medical community at the, of the time in that he was placed into an institution where he stayed until his death, never had surgery for his potentially correctable congenital heart disease. And very much in contrast to my niece, who had a child also with trisomy 21, born just a few years ago, who had very successful surgery performed shortly after birth, is fully integrated into her family with her terrific and wonderful loving parents and sibling and the rest of the family, and I think demonstrates the growth in not only our knowledge and our technology, but also in our ability to deliver medicine to those who are far less fortunate than the rest of us. Um, it was also in the 1960s that just before I came to college here, I took my high school biology class from Mr. Pine, and I can still remember his unbelievable enthusiasm for knowing how many chromosomes there were, for knowing something about the structure of DNA, and I owe a lot of my interest and desire to be a scientist to the kinds of stimulation that I received from him. And again, one of our missions as a society is to be involved in education, and I know that I certainly benefited enormously from that myself. Um, after I uh, came to school here, I was very fortunate to get a job working in a lab where DNA technology was right at the forefront. I was in Gobind Karana's lab for several years working as a lab technician. And then probably the uh, single most important event of my future career choice came when I went to medical school at Tufts and had the opportunity to work under Murray Feingold for a summer carrying out research studies on uh, maternal diabetes and its effect on the unborn fetus, but probably much more importantly, observing him and how he cared for patients. And one of the most valuable lessons that I learned uh, watching him over the seven years or so that I was both a medical student and a resident was his incredible commitment to the patient and the family that was in front of him. And although I will never achieve his capacity for doing that kind of work, 
Um, I'll always be grateful for the message that he gave to me about that. And I was equally lucky to uh, take my first faculty position in Iowa where the same messages were passed on to me by my boss there, Jim Hansen. Um, after I left Tufts, I went to a postdoctoral fellowship under Arno Matulski, and it was under Arno's direction that I really be developed my passion both for molecular biology and its application in human genetics, and subsequently for my interest in some of the social and ethical aspects of genetics, and I'll, I'll return to that again. And I won't spend any time talking about DNA sequencing or applications. All of you who are here are eagerly awaiting the time uh, 20 minutes or so from now when the plenary sessions talks begin and you'll get to hear some of the terrific science that's going to take place at this meeting. Um, and the benefits that I've had as a scientist has been to be in this community for the period of time when we've seen such enormous changes in science and science technology. I put in one slide that, um, whoops, I put in one slide that I um, showed a couple of weeks ago when I was giving a talk in Seattle that I thought would resonate a little bit perhaps with the audience here. <clears throat> and this is a picture taken from an article that was the first scientific article on which I played a major role, again under Arno's direction, and it shows um, a single SNP, or as we called them back in the day, an RFLP, or Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, um, segregating in what it turns out to be Arno's family. And we essentially were able to get um, a quite significant publication, at least for the time, in PNAS, really based around identifying a single SNP, or a single RFLP. And I did a little back of the envelope calculation a few days ago and figured that there's about a billion SNPs that are identified every single day right now. And although uh, nobody's getting a paper for that directly, um, at least for myself, the career change that we've undergone where you can go from identifying a single SNP such as this and have it having some resonance in the scientific community to the things that we can do now are, are really quite amazing. And then I'm also very grateful to Arno and his family, who are actually the people on that slide, who provided their DNA samples to us to carry out uh, the analysis. Well, when you give a lecture like this, I think probably many people are called to look back at what people before them have said. So I'm going to run uh, fairly quickly through some quotes from some earlier presidents to illustrate, again, some points about the society and, again, to sort of segue into the uh, uh, strategic plan issue. So the first president was H.G. Mueller, and when I read his talk, I was struck by this quote. So, the prevailing view has been that mutation as a direct cause of disease is extremely rare and of little practical significance. Since observational data are limited to relatively few generations, and since human crossbreeding experiments may not be performed, we shall never be able to demonstrate with certainty that a hereditary human disease arises from a mutation. So I in, in no way want to um, suggest that uh, Professor Mueller wasn't an unbelievably talented, gifted scientist because he was, but this also demonstrates sometimes that we don't have the ability to see the future, although as you'll see subsequently many of our presidents did have incredible visions into it. And if you were to talk to a Mike Bamshad or a Evan Eichler or a Les Biesecker about the many mutations, either point mutations or copy number variants that they've identified that are de novo, you would certainly well understand how our capacity for identifying mutations is uh, really quite amazing. Jim Neal was the first president um, that I actually knew personally, um, and he said, it would be redundant in this company to extol the advantages of membership in the ASHG. Our society, by what I am sure is careful design, has adopted as the only requirement for our presidential address that the speaker talk about some subject close to his heart at the moment. And particularly in the last portion of this talk, I will do exactly that. I have uh, at least one or two messages that I want to convey to people. Clark Fraser, who I think was probably the coolest president that we had, um, <clears throat> said this. It was suggested that I should call my talk Ponderings of a Peripatetic Pediatrician, but the fact that I'm not a pediatrician spoils the alliteration. I'll mention as an aside that if you're my wife or someone who works in my lab, you would certainly agree with the peripatetic part for me, certainly over the last several months. Um, and I am a pediatrician, but I'm not sure the quality of the work that I'll talk about really reaches the level of a, a pondering. Uh, he continued, so I air some thoughts that are either too trivial or vague or so completely unsupported by data that I could not present them anywhere but in a presidential address. <laughs> so I'm going to take advantage of this to go through some of that as well. Uh, Clark Fraser, surprisingly, was actually the first president in which he, DNA is actually mentioned in his, in his address. And I was pretty surprised that it took eight years for that to actually happen. And he, in this case, was quite prescient in that he said, let's admit that the DNA-RNA code isn't the whole answer. 
there are no doubt other systems that transmit genetic information that may be very important in developmental processes. It may well be that not all familial intrinsically determined diseases and defects will be traced to alterations in the DNA. The people who claim that a familial anatomical malformation is no different in principle than a deformed sickle cell hemoglobin molecule are, I think, oversimplifying the situation. And I doubt that anencephaly, for instance, will ever be identified as a molecular disease. That's at least currently still true for anencephaly. And again, um, you know, some 50 years ago to have this kind of insight that I think really does presage many of the ways in which we think about the causes of disease not being only located in the DNA sequence was uh, quite remarkable. Victor McCusick, who is probably our most embedded uh, president in all aspects of genetics, talked a lot about the clinical connections that we have as a society. So in 74, he says, do we wish to become involved with credentialing, recertification, formal continuing education, self-assessment, quality assurance, medical audit? Questions about credentialing of non-MDs who play important roles in the delivery of genetic services will arise. <clears throat> Jurisdictional disputes between medical genetics and laboratory medicine over cytogenetic and biochemical determination conceivably will also arise. Questions of reimbursement for genetic services by third-party payers have already risen. And all of that, as you can well recognize, are certainly issues that we've confronted. We confronted during our separation, or at least collaboration with the College of Medical Genetics, with our split from the genetic counselors. And then finally, Victor notes, when some form of national health insurance is implemented, these questions will become more pressing. Well, it's hard to think of anything that's been more pressing for all of us over the last couple of months over the disputes that arose over the Affordable Care Act and the devastating impact that that's had on everybody in this audience in terms of not only their research but their ability to provide care and carry out their careers. So Arno Matulski again. Um, I was very fortunate to be working in Arno's lab when he went to Israel in the early 1980s to participate in a kind of trial in absentia of Joseph Mengele who had been a physician in Auschwitz and who tortured and experimented on many twin pairs. Arno in his address said, let us not forget that human genetics was horribly misused by the Nazi government of Germany in the 1930s. Somewhat later, from the opposite end of the political spectrum, the Lysenkoists destroyed human genetics in the Soviet Union. As responsible human geneticists, we must speak out and differentiate those findings which are generally accepted biological realities from others which are interpretations and flights of fancy. And one of the most valuable lessons that came out of this contact with Arno was this recognition, I think in me, for at a very early stage of my career, how important politics was in, the, in science and the direct connection between those two things. And I'll always be grateful to him, not only for the leadership he played in developing my scientific career, enabling me to have the freedom to become an independent investigator, <clears throat> but I think um, even more importantly to understand the importance of uh, the social biological aspects of it. Well, the last bit I think I have on presidents um, until the very end comes uh, in part from what our tagline is. So all of you will have seen as you look at our logo that ASHG's mission is to discover, to educate, and to advocate. And each of the last several presidents I was struck in going through their talks uh, really, I think, reached out to us as individuals to go beyond just the research that we do to do something more than just what we find ourselves carrying out in our day jobs. Ed McCabe had a wonderful riff on evolution and the important role that it plays. And as we're at a meeting where complex traits and the selection of single nucleotide variants for evolutionary purposes and the way in which we've evolved in humans now have impact on our modern diseases such as type 2 diabetes um, should always cause physicians to think about evolution and its impact whenever they're seeing a patient. Rod McInnes gave a very moving talk, particularly on the relationship that geneticists have to culture, and talked a lot about Native Canadians and how we need to be so sensitive to individuals outside of our own purview. Lynn Jordy, who's not only been a terrific scientist, but has also committed an enormous amount of his time and effort to education, talked about how important that is for us and how we need to, again, extend ourselves beyond the laboratory to work to educate everyone from K through 12 to his own work on uh, educating judges and lawyers in the area of forensics. 
And then Mary Claire, in her really wonderful uh, presentation last year, talked about the scientist as a citizen of the world. And it's hard to top uh, the message that she gave. Um, I will make a very feeble attempt to, do, to create an appendix to what she talked at the end of my talk. Um, but she really, uh, I think, did a terrific job of making us think about the vision that we sh must have of not only ourselves, but of this wider world that we work in as well. Well, I've mentioned strategic plans several times, so I'll briefly got, kind of go through what I want people to be encouraged to think about. So this is the generic vision um, that was put together by Joe McInerney and our staff um, over the last several months as we've undertaken this effort to think about where we are and where we're going to be going. And three things came to light from this. One was to assess the status and likely future of research, translation, education, and advocacy. We kind of talked about that a little bit already. Second two is ensure that you, that we serve our membership and continue to be um, the leading professional society in human genetics and to work with other such societies clo as closely as we can. And then finally to specify goals and strategies um, for the structure and function of our society in all of its aspects over the next three to five years. And I think also to think um, beyond that as well. The plan is going to take us into thinking about many aspects of the society and if I can encourage you to do anything over the next few days outside of attending the wonderful scientific presentations and meeting with colleagues and friends. It will be to think about some of these issues, bring your ideas to us on Thursday night when we meet about this, um, and talk to your colleagues about the hall. And we will be uh, putting up on websites aspects of the strategic plan for everyone to comment on so that we can ultimately get the feedback of all of the society. We're particularly keen that younger members of the society who are going to be much more familiar with technology developments and social media can really help us to think about how we can make this meeting at the top better for all of us going forward. In addition, we've had an enormously successful journal. Many of the previous editors of that journal are here tonight. It has a terrific impact factor. Um, all of us strive to get our best work published in that journal. But the nature of journals is also changing. And David Nelson is faced with an enormous challenge of open access journals, uh, the generation of new journals in the same space of genetics and the ability to distinguish between print publications and electronic publications that we need to find where is the best fit and place for us going forward. Our society has always had some balance between basic and translational and clinical sciences and going forward we need to continue to think about that. All of these are important and critical elements of who we are and what we do but we need to decide and think about do we need to put more emphasis in certain areas over others or we can, can we continue to um, encompass everybody under a single tent. This leads into the balance of the subdisciplines. Computational biology, bioinformatics is increasingly playing a larger and larger role in our societal meetings. And over our 60-year history, we've seen the waxing and waning of many different subdisciplines, clinical, biochemical, population genetics, behavioral, genetic counseling, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Going forward, we need to be able to anticipate these changes, to be leaders in working with them as they come along, and not be followers and just incorporating them years after others have identified these as important components of how geneticists do their work. Education I've already mentioned several times, and I won't continue to um, beat that drum, but all of you should be carrying out education not only in your laboratories, but in your daily lives. People you meet on airplanes flying out here, talking to your family members, uh, talking to the person next to you at a soccer game about what it is that you do so that we can have a more literate, informed, and supportive public. Policy I'll come back to um, in a second as well, but all of us can serve as advocates for the policies that envelop genetics. Genetics is and continues to be extremely controversial in many, many settings. Not everybody embraces genetics um, as something useful and important as uh, there are arguments continuing to rage over GMOs and prenatal diagnosis and DNA sequencing and all of the many important social and ethical and legal aspects related to that. And then finally, the sometimes boring but nonetheless critical stuff of governance, membership, management. All of these we need to consider going forward in, a, in our society. And all of these are areas in which not everybody in here will be interested in everything, but almost everybody should have at least some opinion about something that can benefit our thinking in ways of making us stronger. Well, I mentioned this once before, but 
Um, we are very challenged in putting this meeting together and really the, both um, the program committee under Andy Clark's direction as well as the staff had to confront the possibility that many of our members, particularly those who are uh, supported by the government working at NIH or CDC, were not going to be able to attend this meeting. It forced them to cancel some sessions, reschedule others, then re-reschedule other things. And I think what this points out is that in addition to the acute crisis of the last couple of months, and we need to remember the impact of the sequester on funding, which has dropped NIH budgets by almost 6% over the last year, that politics is really important to all of us who do research. There's no better career than to be involved in genetics research and to be involved in the beauty of the discovery of finding things that can help to improve the health of all of our fellow humans going forward. But at the same time, there are the realities of how politics plays into funding. And we can only um, encourage our students as they become terrific scientists and develop a passion for research and go forward doing it in whatever context that might be, that they also become involved in the political system and that they work towards supporting those kinds of politicians that will be supportive of the kinds of things that they think are most important. The, the last bit of proselytizing I'll do um, comes from this slide. And um, although I've been thinking about this talk for actually a couple of years, as you'll see in a second, <clears throat> it's only been over the last uh, you know, month or two that I've really been putting it together. And just about a week before um, I was sort of putting the, what I thought were the finishing touches on my slide, I got an email from Godfrey Oakley. Godfrey, um, I think as many of you will know, uh, was at CDC for many years. He was the primary force behind the introduction of folic acid into flour supplies as a supplement in the United States, which has had an enormous impact on decreasing the burden of neural tube defects. And Godfrey um, wrote to me and said, you know, if, if you haven't finished your talk yet, you might think about this. And he included a copy of an article that he and Bob Brent had written a few years ago, the topic of which was the fierce urgency of now. And so that's really the final message that I want to leave you with. The infant shown in the upper right-hand corner there is a child with neonatal tetanus that I saw and photographed when I was in the Philippines in the mid-1980s. Uh, that child died the next morning, and over the first five or six years that I went to the Philippines, I would routinely see five or six such children in public health hospitals serving the um, indigent population in the Philippines where their mothers had not received tetanus vaccinations, where their umbilical cords had been cut non-sterily, and they subsequently developed and died from neonatal tetanus. I can honestly say that the first time I saw a child with that, I didn't even think that that was a problem that existed in the world anymore. I had personally benefited um, in my own family from the work that the March of Dimes and others did on developing a polio vaccine. I'd actually had polio when I was four years old, but my children didn't have to worry about that because they were vaccinated. So when I learned that in the mid-1980s, 800,000 infants a year were dying of neonatal tetanus, 800,000 in the mid-1980s, a scale of death that nowadays is only rivaled by things like malaria and HIV, I was just completely astounded. And although I've not done a very good job in my own career of addressing that specific problem, I am proud to say that as a nation and through philanthropies and WHO and others, the burden of neonatal tetanus has now dropped to below 50,000, but it's still at 50,000. There are still 50,000 babies a year dying of a completely preventable disease. So the message that Bob had and that he wanted me to convey, and which I'm more than happy to do, is that all of us need to think not only about our science and the science that's in front of us, and not only about the patient and the patients that are sometimes in front of us, and not only about the work that we do as a part of culture and education, but also a small part of our lives thinking about these problems that are immediately addressable right now and where we just don't have the political will or the funding to do it. There's going to be babies dying tomorrow that don't have to die, babies dying today that don't have to die, and I encourage everyone here to spend at least a few percent of their lives and careers thinking and addressing those problems as well. Okay, now for the, uh, the big finish. So two years ago, uh, when I learned that I was going to be president, I got this email from Rod McInnes, who at that time was the serving president. Rod wrote to me the email that you see here. Jeff, once a week for the next two years, you will wake up at night in a cold sweat, anxious about the 
and I'm not sure how David Ortiz would read that, but I think you can probably figure it out, uh, presidential address. Trust me, ciao. <clears throat> well, Rod was right, as he usually is, just as Mary Claire is as well. And although I can't say that every single week over those two years I woke up in a cold sweat some night, I can tell you that every night for the last week I've woken up in a cold sweat. So I'm really glad that this is almost over and really glad that I've had an opportunity to convey to you um, both a personal message and a larger message for the society as a whole and that all of you will spend at least a little bit of time during this meeting thinking about how we can move the society forward in a powerful and useful way that will continue to be of tremendous service to its membership and you'll spend also a little bit of your time um, thinking about these problems that we can address right now where we have the tools, whether it's in the United States or in Malawi or in Afghanistan, and that we try to put some effort into uh, dealing with the things that we can do now, now. And then finally, I have lots of acknowledgments. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, without naming specific names, I have many students, lots of staff I've worked with, nurses, genetic counselors, and colleagues over the year that have really made my scientific career enjoyable, wonderful, fun, and all the things that it should encourage you who are young to go into science as well. Um, I chose four specific names because these are people without whom I would not have had a scientific career, <clears throat> nor would I have uh, had four friends that have really served me so well. Um, Ken Buto, Cork Christensen, Brian Schutte, and Mar Marizita have all been terrific scientific colleagues for me. And I mentioned earlier uh, how grateful I am to the clinicians that I trained under and to my early mentors, but these four people have become my friends and colleagues and um, have really made the, the life of a scientist enjoyable, if not every single minute, almost every single minute. I again want to thank the staff and the membership of the ASHD for the opportunity to work with all of you. And then finally, patients and families um, that I still have the opportunity to continue work with and who I learn from you know, every day about their strength and their ability to carry on. And then lastly and most importantly, uh, my wife, Anne Marie McCarthy, who's here in the audience today, um, our oldest son, Ryan, who was born at the Boston Hospital for Women Lying In Division um, uh, some 33 years ago and then worked um, at the hospital across the street, Boston Children's, last year learning how to be a pediatric ENT doc. Uh, our two younger kids, Chris and Katie, all of our kids went to college in Boston. Um, my daughter-in-laws, Sharmila and Alma, and then our, our first grandchild, uh, Fatima or Bomboncita. All of us are diehard Red Sox fans. I apologize to those of you who are Cardinals fans. I hope it goes seven games. I hope it goes to the bottom of the ninth, and I hope that the best team wins. Thank you.